to our weekly uh, SAOR uh, commercial real estate chat series. Uh, so our guests this week are Ian uh, Grissard and Kevin Spalacy from 10X, uh, another uh, chapter annual sponsor. Uh, Ian and Kevin are planning to talk about the auction process. I, I know many of us are familiar with it, uh, but many of us are not. Um, they're also going to provide their thoughts on the market and different asset classes uh, pre-COVID and, uh, and now in our post-COVID world, what's hot and what's not, <clears throat> what's going on in the Northeast compared to other regions of the country, and perhaps some thoughts about the market in the coming months and uh, into next year. So before we begin, I um, just want to acknowledge all our annual sponsors. As I mentioned, uh, 10X is an annual sponsor, um, and they're, they're listed uh, at the bottom of our invite. But let me run through. Uh, there's Bank of America, uh, Community Investment Corporation, uh, Claris Construction, uh, Declare Office Group, uh, Godfrey Hoffman Hodge, uh, Civil Engineers, uh, McDermott, Reynolds, and Glissman, uh, R.D. Cento, uh, Petra Construction Corporation, Savings Bank of Danbury, and uh, PES uh, Structural Engineers. Um, we kind of went over the format as Harry was signing in, but uh, just to, as a reminder, um, everyone's going to remain muted, and they, uh, their individual videos are, will be uh, disabled as well. Um, anyone with questions can use the chat box and we'll make them a part of the uh, uh, discussion. And we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, so please ask away. Um, and again, like the other sessions we've done uh, in the past, we will be recording this and it will be available on the chapter's web, uh, website. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Ian and uh, Kevin. Thanks, Art. I uh, really appreciate uh, the opportunity. And uh, as you guys know, I enjoy traveling up to Connecticut for uh, the SIOR monthly meetings. They're always in uh, great locations. And, uh, you know, proud to be, you know, a sponsor for the Connecticut chapter for a number of years. Um, nationally, I think we're at seven back to back sponsors uh, sp uh, for the uh, for SIOR. Um, Many of you know me. I've had the pleasure of, uh, of working on opportunities or evaluating opportunities for you. Uh, for those uh, that this is the first time um, uh, hearing me, uh, seeing me, um, I've been involved with SIOR uh, for over 15 years, uh, past chapter president of uh, New Jersey. And uh, one of the things I was very proud of while chapter president is uh, that we won a national award for a community program related to Hurricane Sandy. So obviously a different set of circumstances than the uh, pandemic, but uh, kudos to uh, your chapter. Uh, and I know it's Connecticut, Western Mass as well. Um, just for the way you guys have embraced uh, working remotely and still keeping the members together. Um, we're involved with a lot of different organizations and uh, on a weekly basis, I don't think anyone does anything to the level uh, that, uh, that, that uh, art and leadership is, is doing. Um, it's going to be a very high level overview on 10X. Uh, then we're going to talk about the market and go into uh, question and answers. Um, so um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Kevin Spalacy, Executive Director of 10X. Uh, he uh, works with our national sales team. Uh, Kevin, uh, please take it away. Thanks, Ian. Uh, thanks, uh, Art and Bernadette. Appreciate the opportunity to be with everybody today. Appreciate everybody logging on and allowing us to take a little bit of time to just kind of discuss 10x, um, what the platform is all about, and really kind of what we're seeing in the marketplace today. So, um, again, we'll try and dive in, give you a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Um, and as Ian and, and Art both um, insinuated, we'd like to make this as interactive as possible. So hopefully we'll get through some some information slides quickly and then get into kind of process uh, discussions moving forward. So um, let's kind of go right to the next slide, Ian. Um, so just a little bit of um, 
uh, you know, ground setting here on who we are and our history as a company. Um, so you can see that in 2009, uh, we actually conducted our first commercial auction. Um, so we just celebrated 10 years in the business. Um, you know, we primarily started this business on the uh, previous downturn, and we were uh, used as a platform for primarily special servicers and large financial institutions who had to move product. And so that's really where it started in 2009. And the precursor before that was actually the residential side of the business, which is now a standalone company called auction.com. Um, so we conducted our first auction in 2009, and we've been doing them, them really ever since. Um, over the first five years, we were, really worked to refine our process as an auction business, what that process looked like from a customer experience. Um, and in late 2013, early 2014, we actually caught the eye of um, Capital G, which is Google's capital investment. And in 2014, they made a, an investment in the company at around $50 million and really made that investment to partner with us on the, the data and analytical side of our business to really help us refine the identification of appropriate buyers for assets as we were marketing them. And we'll get into that in a little more detail in, in future slides. 2016, we rebranded ourselves from auction.com to 10x. Um, and that was really kind of twofold, right? Um, you know, auctions are what we do, but um, we had really seen an exponential growth in our business. And so leadership at that point really wanted to kind of move in a different direction from a branding perspective. And so we changed our name to, to 10x at that point. I think what was also interesting at that juncture is we really started to see our business evolve from not just being primarily from special servicers and lenders and financial institutions, we saw more of the private client business start to emerge and come to the platform and utilize it as a transaction methodology. 2017, Thomas H. Lee, which is a private equity firm out of Boston, actually acquired both auction.com and 10X Commercial at the time for roughly about 1.6 billion. Um, they have, have been really great partners for us and continued to invest in the business over the last three years. Um, and, and actually, at the beginning of this year, just separated both auction.com as a standalone and 10x commercial as a standalone. And then, uh, for those of you who may be aware and those of you who may not, um, as recently as just about three weeks ago, CoStar has announced that they are going to be acquiring 10x commercial and uh, we will become part of the CoStar. Uh, company, uh, family of, uh, or company within the CoStar family, and we will continue to be a standalone uh, company operating under the CoStar brand, but 10X Commercial will still exist. We will be a standalone company that is, you know, kind of allowed to run our business um, as an add-on to the CoStar family of companies. So, um, Ian, I think you're taking the next slide. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. So, um, our, um, our, our, Platform process is primarily live bid auction, um, which I'm going to uh, highlight just in terms of uh, the timeline and, and what's involved. Um, and that typically is properties that fall within, you know, a uh, million dollars up to $15 million. You know, there's no set parameters of um, what is a live bid deal or a potential managed bid deal. The difference with the managed bid uh, platform is uh, tends to be best in class assets, um, higher priced properties where your caliber of buyer could be more uh, institutional uh, or uh, private equity fund or real estate investment trust where um, they don't necessarily want to compete for that high caliber asset in an auction with an, an unknown amount of uh, buyers that they need to do additional due diligence. So what managed bid allows for is um, a call for uh, indicative bids. Um, still, there's an undisclosed minimum reserve price. Um, and then shortlisting those uh, buyers, which uh, reach a certain uh, threshold, giving those buyers uh, additional time to underwrite the deal, knowing that they are on a shortlist, and then putting them into a private auction. Um, that managed bid process um, was um, the result of uh, us selling a $96 million office property in California, which remains the largest uh, online transaction of, of anything. Um, I think second to that, Mark Cuban, you know, bought a jet for like $50 million. But um, I'll show you a case study at the end of the presentation on, um, on a managed bid deal uh, close to home for everyone. So just, you know, 
um, talking about the foundation and what Kevin had mentioned, when we did our first online transaction in uh, 2009, we were really only geared up for uh, institutional uh, sellers. We, we were not doing, you know, mainstream deals. And um, r really, um, e-commerce wa was something that really came into play to give us the ability to expand um, into a larger segment of the market. But in terms of whether we're selling a million dollar property for your high net worth uh, client or uh, a second or third generation family, or whether we're selling a deal for an institution, we set up the deals exactly the same way, the document vaults are set up the same way, and the process is set up the same way. So, you know, whether you're, you know, Bank of America um, sold, a, I personally sold a number of uh, bank branches for um, Jeff Ryer and I, you know, we worked on an out parcel uh, as well. Um, Bricksmore is a client of mine, which happens to be uh, that uh, property in Meriden, Connecticut, that, uh, that I showcased a deal last week, uh, you know, Fortress, Key Bank, Starwood Capital, all very demanding clients. And uh, we give you as the, the broker or seller the same level of service as, uh, as our top uh, institutional clients. So just on a very high level, and again, I realize many of you are aware of our process uh, of LiveBid. Um, it's simply, um, identifying an opportunity that may be a candidate for our platform, you know, we'd have discussions, we'd evaluate it. Um, not everything matches up for our platform, you know, no differently than as trusted advisors, you know, not every deal is going to be um, uh, on your radar as being a great match for, you know, what you do, but we'll always give you an honest assessment and we're trying to determine, you know, realistic seller expectations in terms of pricing. Um, our deals have a undisclosed reserve price, which we work hand in hand with the broker to determine. And once we're on the same page on that undisclosed reserve, we have a very simple marketing agreement. And then our goal is within 21 days um, after signing a marketing agreement, which also identifies who the broker is, um, that we want to be live to market with a very comprehensive a property display page, uh, a document vault only accessible through a signed confidentiality agreement, um, a purchase and sale agreement, which is non-negotiable, will be in the document vault, the broker's offering memorandum, um, income and expenses, if it, uh, if it does have income on the property, if it's vacant, you know, uh, past year expenses, you know, taxes, insurance, utilities, et cetera. Um, what's really interesting uh, is, um, you know, prior to me joining 10X, I used 10X as a broker. 10X was a vendor. And I really liked the fact that all the due diligence was done in advance. So really what we're doing in this, you know, process of heading up to auction, you know, between, you know, 42 and 50 days is that buyers have the opportunity to feel comfortable with the property and view everything as if they were under contract during due diligence. The difference is, Everyone is doing their due diligence simultaneously without controlling the deal. Um, we also require an updated phase one, um, a property condition assessment report. Um, 10X will fund the upfront cost of those reports. And um, it's only a reimbursable expense to us by the um, seller if the property trades. Um, but we're paying for all the marketing costs. We're paying for photography. Um, and um, it's an interactive marketing campaign hand in hand with, uh, with the listing broker. I mean, the, the listing broker remains the, the quarterback of the deal. We're going to aggregate interest and activity from a larger uh, a geographic area with a diverse buyer pool, but we want the broker to remain a uh, primary point of contact as the local market expert to talk about the deal. Um, the goal is after six to seven weeks of marketing the property and doing weekly update calls where we have a great interactive dashboard uh, for transparency and excellent reporting to you know the owner uh, which takes a lot of the burden off the broker of you know you know having to prepare week in and week out of what did i do this past week you know i got to put together a report everything is there for you so you can focus on what's most important which is 
dealing with high level prospects and trying to sell the deal. Um, but we're trying to get to the point of getting buyers engaged and converting signed confidentiality agreements into, uh, into registered bidders. And when we, uh, when we get to the auction, um, there's two days of live bidding. And in order for a buyer to participate, they have to sign an agreement. Um, and they're making commitments as well to, to be part of it. Um, they have to show a minimum level of proof of funds, which is usually tied into uh, what the starting bid price is. And um, we do have a criteria of what constitutes liquid proof of funds. We're also going to check out who their LLC is. I uh, want to make sure, you know, uh, there's someone, if they have worked on our platform before, that, th that they have performed. Um, and then most importantly, to the seller and broker, the buyer is committing to, um, if they do bid and win, they have to sign that non-negotiable purchase and sale agreement within two hours after winning bid, um, keeping in mind that they've had, um, you know, 45 plus days to see that purchase and sale agreement, which most sellers use the 10X standard 12 page agreement. Um, they can customize the PSA with a specific addendum. Um, and we'll also add a rider, you know, whatever's normal and customary in Connecticut or Massachusetts or other states will be added to, uh, to the PSA as well. So besides having to sign the contract within uh, two hours, they need to fund 10% non-refundable earnest money deposit uh, within 24 hours. And then our standard closing um, is, is 30 days. And um, I just like to emphasize that, you know, as it relates to what I call our COVID auctions, which Kevin is gonna touch on in a little bit more detail. On many deals now, we're recommending to sellers that um, they consider adding an addendum to the PSA to allow a buyer an extra 30 days to close in exchange for uh, an additional 5% earnest money. So what happens then is a buyer has 60 days to close. It's still as is, where is. Uh, the seller has 15% non-refundable in escrow. Um, and it just gives a buyer a little bit more time to get financing, you know, if, if they have that ability. And surprisingly, we are still seeing many buyers putting financing in place and it tends to be, you know, buyers and investors who have uh, existing lending relationships and they're letting their lenders know in advance of the auction, hey, I'm bidding on this property. Here's the phase one, here's the PCA, here's the offering memorandum. If I win, you know, I need to hit the ground running. I'll have either 30 days to close or 60 days to close. Um, our vendor, uh, engineering and environmental vendor, will also, for a nominal fee, uh, provide that phase one report in the winning bidder's name. So um, the lender has that level of reliance on, uh, on environmental, which is great. So I would tell you live bid works very well for a seller or broker who see the value in an efficient, expedited process with very strict guidelines, um, which results in a um, high certainty of close. Um, when we have uh, a winning bidder, 97% of our deals close. And I believe in our COVID auctions, we could be at 100%. You know, Kevin will uh, touch on that um, a little more. And then final item, which I always uh, uh, tend to forget is that 10X gets paid by the buyer in the form of a buyer's premium. So we are a no fee service to the seller, uh, to the broker. We fund the marketing costs. Um, and the only potential out-of-pocket cost, as I mentioned earlier, is um, if we do transact, we do wanna be reimbursed by the seller for uh, the out-of-pocket cost on the, uh, on the phase one and the, uh, and the PCA. Um, and just in terms of our track record, um, retail has been uh, our uh, number one uh, asset class in terms of total sales, followed by um, office, multifamily, hotel, uh, industrial, and then uh, special types of assets. Um, interesting to note is that during COVID, um, industrial, um, even though our vol even though it was not number one in volume it was our number one asset class in terms of trade rate, uh, which is 
you know, whatever industrial came to the platform, we had the most success in that asset class, which is, uh, you know, just as we all know, the demand, you know, um, for industrial assets. In Connecticut, I'll share with you guys, 10X has sold uh, close to 85 properties um, at almost uh, 230 million um, in, in total deal size. Um, uh, the, an average deal of a little over two and a half million per deal. And our stats per deal is uh, we have on average six fully approved bidders um, who are placing 14 bids over the two day uh, live bid process. And um, over the 45 to 50 day marketing period, on average in Connecticut, we've had uh, over 1400 unique views per property and um, just under 70 signed confidentiality agreements. So um, a metric I like to use is if we're capturing 10% uh, approved bidders from signed confidentiality agreement, that's a good number. In this case, 70 signed confidentiality agreements averaging six fully approved vetted bidders who have shown proof of funds and are ready to transact and close you know, in, in 30 or, uh, or 60 days. Um, the last slide I'll share and then turn it back over to Kevin to talk about um, you know, what we're seeing in the market is uh, in terms of you know, the marketing that we do in conjunction uh, with the broker as the local market expert, um, it's really uh, a seamless um, partnership. And um, for the independent firms, uh, which I was when I used 10X, I really liked the fact that they covered all my bases in terms of targeted third party emails, you know, besides the 10X data lake of 500,000 investors that we procured over 10 years, 11 years, you know, longer than anyone else, you know, we use third party services like Globe Street and industry publications. Um, snail mail was still sending out uh, postcards, you know, uh, marketing your specific property as the, as the featured property. And then a multitude of listing services, both nationally and internationally. And we do, especially in the tri-state area, we do see registered bidders um, from out of the country. Uh, we do think CoStar will have a big play in expanding that base. And to buy a property on 10X, you just need a US federal tax ID number. Um, we will do a know your customer uh, check to make sure they're uh, a good character, so to speak and they can bid on, on our properties. Um, you'll also see for the higher profile properties, we will have um, uh, advertisements in trade publications as well. And again, 10X is funding all of this. So for the independents, to be able to focus on high level prospects and sell the deal, knowing that everything else is gonna happen, you know, in terms of funding, marketing, photography, managing the deal process, um, it's all there for you. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I joined 10X after I transacted because uh, it resonated with me and I saw the value add, you know, for, for, um, for brokers and, and sellers and buyers, you know, the level playing field and transparency that uh, buyers get. So Kevin, I'll turn it over to you for the next couple of slides to talk about, you know, what we're seeing in the marketplace as well as our broker uh, program we have. So and, take it away. Just, just, yeah. just, just one quick, quick question before we sure. turn it over to Kevin. You yeah. know, but most of the folks on the phone are brokers. And I was just wondering if you could add, you know, a couple more comment, uh, a, a, a little bit more color on the role of the broker in um, uh, any given deal uh, with your team. And um, you know, do you do you take a do you take an auction without a broker? I just if you could just yeah close the loop great, on that a little question, bit, and Art, maybe and Kevin I'll, wants to pick that up. Yeah, Thanks. yeah, and I'll, I'll touch on that on these next couple slides because I think it's really relevant here, Art. So. Um, uh, just one thing I just want to note, Thomas Orofino asked a question about how a loan, I think it's a PACE loan he was referencing, whether delinquent or not would affect the process. So Thomas, we'll get to that uh, to answer your question here in a, just a second. But you know, to Art's point, um, uh, everyone on the call, uh, Ian and I, our team at 10X, 10X does not take on any deal to the site, to the platform without a third party broker involved in the transaction. Um, you know, we are, we are not brokers. We are, we are a transaction and a marketing platform. And so we do not take any deal on the platform without a third party broker involved in the asset. Um, 
and we'll talk about, you know, really, um, you know, Ian has touched on some of the, the things we do from a marketing capability. We'll touch on some of the back house capabilities that we provide to our brokers that we work with, you know, our contracts and closings team, our escrow teams, all of that. Um, but, you know, maybe we can transition by just talking about the buyer pools that we are creating and how that data is shared with our brokerage partners. So you can see on the slide in front of you, there's really kind of three key statistics. The first is, you know, roughly 50% or more of the buyers that look at deals on the 10X platform are not located from the state in which the asset resides, right? And that's key because, you know, everybody is, is very cognizant of, you know, real estate becoming not just a national playing field, but a global playing field. And so, you know, the, the ability to expand your database as a brokerage partner with 10X is, is, is really almost doubling your potential buyer pool and potential client pool um, because we're bringing 50% of our buyers from outside the state. 85% of the buyers are being sourced through 10X's marketing efforts. Um, and, you know, this is a lot of, we built a lot of the methodology and the process and the, the, the technology around this in our partnership with Google. Um, but I think what is what is is key and probably most important about that is that that number continues to rise, which tells us that these algorithms and these processes that we built in conjunction with our partners like Google and like TH Lee to really hone in on specific targeted efforts at the right finding the right buyer for the right asset are working, and they're driving the right eyes to the site. Um, just by way of example, uh, 18 months ago, that number used to be 70 percent. 70% of our buyers were being sourced from our, our marketing efforts, and now that number is up to 85. So, again, just sort of reinforces that our targeted marketing efforts are working and driving the right eyes to the site for the broker to then engage with those people and really educate them on the value of the asset and the value of the market. And then I think the final statistic is just 80% of the, the buyers on our platform are first-time buyers. Um, and again, you know, uh, about 18 months ago, that number was hovering about 65, 70%. So that number continues to grow, which shows that we are continuing to grow our database, which in terms becomes the database for our brokerage partners on all the deals. One thing that I, I want to share with everybody, and um, maybe if time allows at the end, we, we can demo it. If not, we could certainly follow up. But every broker that works on the 10X platform and brings a listing to the 10X platform is given access to what we call a seller and a uh, broker dashboard. That broker dashboard encapsulates a variety of information from the marketing activities that 10X executes, the date on which they were executed, how many people were targeted in that campaign. But in addition to that, we provide you as the listing broker with access to all of the leads. So you have the ability to see not just, you know, phone number and email address, physical address, how many times somebody accessed the vault, how many documents they downloaded, what document they downloaded and when. All of that ex is exportable into CSV, which then you can upload into whatever CRM of choice you utilize to maintain your database. So, you know, whereas, you know, other platforms may charge for a subscription fee for access to that data, 10X does not. That data is 100% available to you as a listing broker on the platform. And we would hope that you would export that to CSV and add that to your database so that you continue to grow your database with us. So um, Ian, maybe we'll jump to the next slide. Yeah, and Kevin, I just wanna to add to that, um, and Art, uh, sure. it, it, was, it was a great question is, um, I also find um, a lot of uh, brokers benefit from that leads list because if you think about it, all those prospects are tech savvy they understand the 10X platform. In many cases, they own other properties. Um, they know or they're educated that they have to use a broker. So for the listing broker to have access to, you know, 60 to 100 high level prospects, um, it's a great opportunity to cross sell. And I, I really feel anytime you have a property on the 10X platform, there should be an opportunity to pick up, you know, two or three uh, other listings. Um, we just went to contract on a property for an institutional seller in uh, La Vista, Nebraska. And uh, I picked up the phone and I called uh, my buddy, Tim Kerrigan, an SIOR um, and a CCIM. We took our final exam together in 1997. And I said, Tim, you're in Nebraska. We got this great piece of land. Um, do you have anyone that's interested? He said, yeah, let me look into it. Um, so we're under contract with Tim's buyer. And uh, you know, it only took me you know, 23 years to do a deal with Tim. But there was a listing broker on that deal. That Collier's broker was very happy that, you know, it was that personal outreach and that network 
you know, and that's beyond tech, you know, that's just a matter of looking at the property and going the extra distance to try help make a deal, you know, for the seller and broker. Thanks, Ian. Um, so, uh, guys, what you see on the screen in front of you is really the statistics that we've experienced on the platform since COVID hit. And so this is kind of as of the start of our March auctions, which was the first week of March. And this runs all the way through our auctions last week that can kind of concluded the May, uh, May transaction period for us. So, you know, a couple things I just want to call out, you know, in that, that roughly 90 day period, we brought 200, over 200 assets to the platform, 120 of those um, successfully traded and are now in escrow or have closed. It's close to nearly $300 million worth of real estate throughout the country. You can see the success rate there was, uh, was right at 59%. Um, I think what, what I really want to focus on um, just on this part is the, the sold price to reserve. Um, and, and then the unsold high bid to reserve. So, you know, the goal in the mark in in the auction platform is to really ensure that we are engaging the market when you have multiple people bidding and competing for an asset. Because what the market wants to see is that the seller is willing to meet a market and show reserve met when there are multiple bodies engaged, because that's when the buyers get to determine what the final price that the asset trades at. Right. And, and so that's key. You can see that when the sellers of the 60 percent that we traded, when the sellers met the market and showed reserve met with multiple bidders engaged, they got an additional 23 percent beyond where they met the market in terms of pricing execution. And that's really the, the, the most tr the, or the truest form of that organic competition that you're looking for that the auction can bring to bear on an asset. Um, some of the other statistics, too, just from a marketing perspective, average number of bids, 13 bids per asset, average number of fully approved bidders. So, again, remember, these are fully approved bidders with proof of liquidity to close this deal in 30 days um, is eight. Average um, non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements signed was 110. Um, just the unique site visits alone, um, those site views are people that look at a property-specific web page, almost 6,500 unique views. And then average number of bids after reserve met, 79. So reserve met is when the market meets the seller's expectation on pricing. And then you can see from there, on average, 79 additional bids after that, which contributed to the seller seeing an additional 23% increase in value on deals that were sold. And then over on the right, you can you can see the uh, asset breakdown. Um, you know, as as Ian mentioned earlier, just to kind of call out, industrial was our top performer, not in terms of the number of units, but out of the the 18, you know, we had an 81% trade rate, I believe, on industrial for the last 90 days. Um, you know, you can see there retail kind of led the way in terms of the number of transactions. Um, and I think everybody can kind of clearly understand why, given the impact that COVID has had on retail, specifically those with a regional and localized footprint um, on this. So, um, you know, uh, I'll kind of um, actually, I think we uh, we have a question that came in uh, from Norman. So, uh, Norman, we'll get to that question in just one second. Ian, maybe we could just flip to the next slide and talk about the, the broker promo um, and then kind of jump into question and answers because it seems like we're getting a couple from the, the group. Yeah, and i just like to wrap up on the slide and mention, you know, in that 59% trade rate, you know, which is close to six out of 10, I, I think that gets us in the Hall of Fame with baseball, right? But uh, so th that that's a pretty good number factoring in hotels tech um, typically are our second top um, asset that is sold. And that's been hammered during COVID. So our hotel trade rate was like 38%, which brought down our overall number. So, you know, where industrial was high, hotel was on the low side. But um, uh, Art, a question you'd asked me the other day, you know, tying into the Northeast and tri-state area, you know, office buildings and suburban office, we're seeing interest in suburban office. Um, we're seeing uh, a little bit of a shift. Um, and everything I've seen is that the cap rate differential between urban and suburban um, is narrowing to the benefit of suburban office because um, people don't necessarily want to commute into the big cities uh, on ma mass transit. And we do think that you're going to see larger companies maybe reducing their footprint in the cities and expanding in the suburbs. Um, so 
Um, we feel that um, suburban office and industrial are going to be really strong asset classes um, in Q4 and Q1 2021. And also, I envision uh, retail being repositioned for, you know, it's, if you think about retail, it's direct entry into the space, it's excellent parking, um, and good repurpose for office or office medical. Um, so that could backfill some of the, uh, some of the uh, retail space. Um, Kevin, if you want to talk about the broker promotion program, and I want to allow time for question and answers. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so just really quickly want to kind of introduce introduce this slide. So, we have a, a broker partnership program that we've implemented at 10X, and and really it is a, a very simple, straightforward way of, you know, the more business a given broker does with us, the the more uh, revenue share 10X has the ability to provide to the broker. Um, and so this sort of dovetails into Norman's question, which is, you know, besides covering the marketing costs, are we compensated as a percentage of the sale from the buyer? That, that's correct, Norman. So our fee is a transaction fee that's paid on top of the purchase price, and that fee is covered by the buyer. They know that when they come to bid on an asset, they have to build in the fact that they have to pay a transaction fee on top of that price. And so um, just back to the broker uh, partnership program, you know, we have we have basically four levels of bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. And as a broker does more business, sources business, brings it to the 10X platform, and that deal successfully closes, that deal goes on the broker scorecard, and we keep track of that in our internal CRM. And so you can see that from deals one through five, the broker receives a 10% revenue share from 10X out of our fee. Silver, that jumps to 20 once you get into gold, you're at 30, and then the platinum obviously is 40%. And the the uh, most important thing about this is that these are lifetime achievements. So you continue to build on these levels as you continue to work with 10x, and they are good in perpetuity. Um, so even if there's a there's a period of time where you know the business that you're doing with 10x isn't as robust as it has been, you don't lose deal count at the end of a year or end of a quarter or end of two years. You keep that deal count through the life of you're doing business with the 10X platform. So, um, you know, again, just another example where 10X is really trying to communicate to the brokerage community that we are here to, to partner with you. We want to be a partner and work with you to help expedite the sale process and bring some of the value propositions that our platform has, which is that surety of close and the date certain execution and then the global buyer base. Ian, anything to add? Yeah, I would just wrap up. I'm going to show you in 30 seconds, sure. two quick slides, which will kind of bookend our capabilities. You know, this was a mixed use deal in Waterbury, Connecticut, which uh, we sold for 1.1 million. You know, seller probably had a reserve price at around a million, you know, a million fifty. So we exceeded that. You know, from the day we signed a marketing agreement, we were to market in 15 days. Uh, we did 45 days of marketing, 60 days, two days of live bid, 62 days. Buyer one had 30 days to close, closed in 14 days. From the day we, the broker signed us up with the seller, you know, we were done and dusted in 76 days. Um, that deal, 75 signed CAs. There's the 10% metric, seven approved buyers. We had 22 bids on the property you know, uh, very happy broker, uh, you know, who brought us that deal. And then on the other end of the, per, um, the scale is a managed bid deal, you know, and boy, talk about good timing on selling this last year, right? Uh, this was a large deal in Milford, Connecticut, uh, where uh, we had 11 initial indicative offers submitted. Uh, seven were picked as best and final. Uh, they were put into a private auction, uh, 25 bids in the, uh, in the private auction you know, yielded a price, you know, of $160 a foot, um, which was the, you know, was the seller's reserve price. Uh, didn't go above reserve on that, but obviously achieved, uh, you know, a really good number. And to sell a $60 million deal from signing a marketing agreement to 105 days, you know, the, uh, the seller and uh, capital markets team on that deal were very happy. So Art, uh, that wraps it up. Uh, we're available to answer questions and really appreciate so it. I'm going to well, thank you very much, Ian and Kevin. Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw out, I don't see any questions, but um, of course I have a few questions. You know, uh, before we started the uh, presentation, um, you guys were throwing out some fairly optimistic results of uh, auctions that were held today. 
numbers wise, volume wise. Just curious how that, um, you know, how those numbers compare to six months ago or a year uh, ago. Um, just, you know, in, uh, in terms of volume. Sure. You Sure. So, um, you know, maybe I'll go ahead and take that one. You can kind of jump in as well. So, um, everybody, I think Art's referring to the fact we had actually had an auction today and we have another one tomorrow. So, you know, just kind of looking at the stats today, you know, we, we had 23 deals in auction. We successfully traded eight, uh, 20 of them, excuse me, and, and met the reserve. So that's roughly an 87% trade rate today. Um, you know, tomorrow we have another 20, call it 20 assets in auction. So we'll, we'll see where um, bidding tops out um, on those tomorrow. You know, what I can tell you from a statistical perspective, um, everyone, is that, you know, we have definitely seen an uptick in both the amount of eyes we are seeing to individual property pages on the 10X website, as well as people signing confidentiality agreements. You know, in the last 90 to 100 days in the COVID environment, we're actually seeing some of our metrics from a, you know, eyes on perspective or confidentiality agreement signed or fully approved bidders for assets exceeding some of our historical averages. So, um, you know, Art, you made the comment earlier that there is liquidity in the market and we are certainly seeing that, um, you know, over, over the course of this. That being said, I will tell you, you know, the slide we showed on COVID, I think we showed 205 assets brought to market between March and May. Um, that is down for us. It's, it's, it's down, you know, I, I think probably by about 75 or 80 assets. So we have seen a decline in the amount of people going to market, but I think that can be probably summed up as people, people were cautious, right? They, they kind of pushed the pause button on coming to market. Um, I think what has been beneficial to us is our ability to communicate that there is liquidity in the market. We are still able to find those cash buyers in this marketplace, and we are still executing, um, you know, with very high trade rates and, and a lot of eyeballs coming to look at the site. Great. Um, Jeff, Jeff Ryer was wondering what the cap rate was on that Milford deal. Do you, do you recall, uh, Ian? No, but I will. Um, I'll share the presentation deck. Uh, Art with you and Bernadette, and I'll uh, let you guys know what the cap rate uh, was as well. Okay, great. Now, and I just want to add to Kevin's comment, something I think everyone will find interesting is, um, I, um, I was looking at um, our, the metrics throughout COVID. Uh, I would start my Monday morning by looking at what happened over the weekend. And I noticed that the amount of views for each and every property went through the roof on, on weekends. So, um, as people were quarantined, um, as opposed to, you know, a normal weekend where you're doing the to-do list, you're doing, you know, getting ready for spring gardening and uh, kids activities or playing golf, people were confined to home. Um, there was a lot more um, hits on our website, a lot more first time inquiries on our website. You know, the fact, um, Kevin spoke about the volume being down. The number was about 30% year over year, you know, March, 2019, versus same time uh, this year. Um, and that was with sellers saying, uh, you know, I'd be crazy to sell my asset right now. Let's wait until, you know, August or September. And as our, I remember we did our first March event and we were all sitting around saying, we can't wait to see the data. We want to see what the results were. And we are always transparent, good, good or bad, we're going to share that data. And as the numbers came in, we were really surprised where the numbers were falling. And it was the first time buyers and flight to quality investments was fascinating. And uh, I think some of that was maybe money that was in, in the stock markets. People said, you know what? I feel it's, it may not be a bad play to buy you know, core real estate if it's a decent asset. If I feel I'm getting competitive pricing, maybe a seller who's going to be more flexible on meeting market pricing. Um, so I think that was a, a big driver for it. So uh, I just wanted to add to that. Great. So and, I think we got, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin, go, go ahead. No, go ahead. All right. I was just going to, I think Norman had a question on uh, proof I, of I was going to ask you, yeah, why, why don't you take that? Perfect. Okay, perfect. So, um, so buyers are required to provide uh, liquidity, uh, proof of liquidity. And so that can be in the form of a bank statement, can be in the form of a stock statement that can be liquidated, things of that nature. We will take letters from lenders, 
but uh, typically it's contained to lines of credit. Um, so, you know, we want people to provide liquid proof of funds up to at least the starting bid. We prefer to have them provide proof of liquidity up to the maximum bid that they, they are going to participate at. So um, hopefully that, that answers Norman's question with regards to proof of funds. Great, great. So before we wind up, um, I'm the clock watcher and we, we have been sticking to 45 minutes and it works great. Um, but I, I, I want to acknowledge um, both you guys and 10X with a couple of testimonials. First one from Mark Duclos. He just wanted uh, everyone to know that, um, that, that his firm has sold two properties through 10X and uh, by far the most detailed pre-marketing uh, preparation of any sale process that, that he's been involved with. Um, and then um, we just we just completed a deal, Ian, um, as you know, and I just wanted to mention everyone. So it, um, the owner was on our session a few weeks ago, uh, Adam Wynn Stanley, and it was a property up in Vermont, and um, and it was rolled out pre-COVID, and we had a lot of activity, and uh, our main tenant um, was they were, they were going to be leaving. I mean, they're a major employer and it never made sense. I kept saying it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. <clears throat> and, um, and then COVID hit and we, we, we delayed the auction. And then one of the buyers just showed up at the building um, and everybody's masked up and, um, uh, and, 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 and the company, it, it's, it's one of the craziest things that the, the company did decide they, they were they were looking at it internally, but they literally were going to have to be moving out like within 60 days. 100 employees, they occupy 250,000 square feet. Um, long story short, they ended up signing a 10-year lease. Uh, the property was taken off the market, but um, you know through your efforts and our efforts, uh, the client was very very happy. You 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 folks got paid a fee for what you brought to the table, and we did as well. And um, you know, I, I learned a long time ago, every deal was is different. That was certainly a different one. We didn't, we didn't auction it, but uh, there, there was success there. So, yeah, I, pre I appreciate that. And it, you know, just emphasizes our flexibility. You know, we have a set recipe of how we do things, but if circumstances develop, our goal is we want the seller and broker to achieve what's uh, in, in their best interest. So if we need to pivot or pause, uh, we will be part of that strategy and give you, you know, our input and guidance. Uh, but ultimately, the seller and broker are in control of what happens. Perfect. Well, thank you again, uh, gentlemen. And um, just before everybody signs off, um, I just wanted to uh, mention that uh, Tom Padgett is going to be leading next week's uh, discussion with uh, Dan DeClaire uh, to talk about uh, changes with interior uh, office uh, design and layouts and uh, things like that. So we'll see you all again next week. Thanks again, guys. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Art.